Hello, and I'm Professor Jason Young at Hunter College in the city of New York. And I'm a social psychologist and I'm pleased to present with, uh, to you today, Unit 9, Social Psychology. And in particular today, I want to talk about something known as the power of the situation, which is something that can very much influence our behavior even when we're not aware of it. I'd like to begin though by giving a general definition of the field of social psychology. And this is the science of how the thoughts, the feelings, and the behaviors of individuals are affected by the actual, the implied, or the imagined presence of other people. In other words, we're simply interested in how you are influenced by others, as well as what things that you may be doing that affect those around you. There's a model of social psychology that I typically use that's shown on your screen, and this model depicts the different pieces of the research that we do. At the very center of it, though, is the circle that's labeled the person. That's you. That's the individual. That's the person that we want to look at in terms of what reactions they tend to show to better understand how people can be affected by the social things around them. There are a number of different reactions that we're very much interested in that people show in social situations. And there are three boxes on the right side of this diagram. The first of these at the top are the thoughts or beliefs that people show. We call these the cognitive processes. And these might be the different types of cognitive reactions that you have when you see someone. How do you evaluate them? What, what do you think about them? What is uh, uh, going through your mind in terms of beliefs you have, maybe even stereotypes that you have about them? So all of the different types of descriptions or, or descriptive reactions that you have would come under these cognitive processes. The middle box refers to your feelings or emotions that you have, and we call these the affective processes. This relates to the types of feelings that another person may elicit from you. Does they, do they make you feel comfortable? Do they make you feel nervous? Do they make you feel happy? All of these different types of emotional reactions matter and have a great role in the way that you choose to interact with others. And then the bottom box relates to the behaviors or the actions, the motor responses that you might show in response to someone. And we call these the behavioral processes. And most simply, and most commonly, we look at these behavioral processes in terms of such things as approach versus avoidance. Are you attracted to someone? Do you want to be around them? Or are you trying to avoid them? On the left side of this diagram, I've simplified the different types of social influences that social psychologists look at, beginning with the historical influences. And this simply refers to those things that may have happened in the past with respect to a particular person or a particular social situation. For example, the room that you're sitting in right now. If it's a classroom, has it been, uh, what, what uh, are previous classes that you've had in there? Are there particular experiences that you've had there that might be influencing the way you feel right now? The other type of influence that we look at are current influences, and those are the immediate pressures of what's going on. So again, thinking about this classroom that you're in, are there other people in the room with you? Are they perhaps looking at you? Are you concerned that they're looking at you? Okay, these types of current influences are an especially strong part of what we study in social psychology. And it is in relation to that, that today I wanna to talk about one particular focus that we have called the power of the situation. And we call it the power of the situation because this is often an unseen force that can have a very strong influence on the ways that we respond, the social behavior that we show. And what I'd like to do today is to highlight four of these different types of social pressures, of situational pressures that we study. Beginning with the mere exposure effect. And this is perhaps one of the most subtle of the power of the situation factors that I'll talk about. And this refers to the idea that repeated exposure to a stimulus, such as an object or a person, can lead to greater liking of that stimulus. In other words, through nothing other than simply repeated exposure to something, we may actually come to like it better. This is a process that was first researched by Robert Zients at the University of Michigan. And he did a number of very creative studies trying to test out the extent to which this repeated exposure effect can actually lead to greater liking. So one of the studies that he did 
was he actually printed foreign words, that is, words from a foreign language that he knew his research participants were unfamiliar with, and he put them on a deck of cards. But they were put in the deck of cards with different frequencies. Some of the words showed up in this deck of cards 16 times. Other words showed up only eight times, others four times, and a few of them showed up only once. And then the deck was shuffled. And they were shown these words one word at a time. And they were asked to simply read through the words once going through the full deck. And at the very end, peculiarly, Zions then asked them to simply give their impression, kind of the gist of what they thought, uh, whether they thought each word that they'd been exposed to might mean something relatively positive or relatively negative or neutral. And what he was particularly interested in was how would the positivity of their evaluation be affected by the frequency by which they were exposed to the words. And sure enough, what he found was those words that they had been exposed to more frequently were on average judged to have a more positive meaning. Now, when he asked people why they evaluated them that way, most folks simply said, well, it's just an intuition. It's just a hunch. In other words, no one had any clue that it was the level of exposure that influenced the amount of feeling that they had, the positivity of the feeling they had for those words. There are other ways in which this mere exposure effect shows up in our lives. One of the most prominent relating to our own impressions of ourselves refers to the fact that we often prefer the mirror images of our faces um, as opposed to the photographed images of our faces that other people can see. And in fact, this is often the reason why we may, may not like the photos of ourselves that we see. Part of the imperceptible reason why that may be the case is because in fact, we are used to the reverse image, okay? The reverse image of ourselves. And so while we prefer that mirror image of our faces, our friends tend to prefer the true image. So they often like the photos of us more than we do. Mere exposure can play a role in our judgments of lots of different things. In fact, one of the most famous examples was the Eiffel Tower in Paris. When it was first built, people hated it. They thought it was an eyesore. They thought this is totally inappropriate for Paris, but in particular, they simply didn't like the way it looked. What they found was though, that over time, as people were repeatedly exposed to it, that increased frequency of exposure led people to like it more and more. And now, of course, it is something that is central to the identity of Paris. Mere exposure can also influence how much we like other people. And in fact, it's one of those interesting things where we might like others, even if we have never said a word to them. So for instance, there might be that person who you pass every day on your way to the bus stop. Someone you pass on the street, someone you pass in the hallways in the school, you've never said two words to them. But over time, as you even incidentally keep being exposed to them, you will often generate a more positive feeling towards them. That is those who we see more frequently, all else being equal, we tend to consider to be more familiar, safer to be around and more likable. The second power of the situation that I'd like to describe is obedience to authority. And this one is a little more famous, a little more obvious, um, in some cases, even a little more controversial. This research on obedience to authority was first studied by Stanley Milgram in the early 1960s. And he was very much interested in the extent to which we might be influenced to do something that we don't want to do simply because an authority asks us to do it. And beyond that, Milgram was interested in how far we would go in potentially harming another person. Imagine, thinking about the study that Milgram originally did, that you went to a laboratory because you'd signed up for a study and you were met by a researcher who looked very official, very authoritative, wearing his white lab coat. And what he informed you uh, that you were about to do was you were gonna participate in a study on memory and learning. And beyond that, you were also going to look at the effect of punishment on motivating people to learn better, to try harder to learn. Well, in fact, in Milgram's study, when his participants arrived, they were assigned the role to play the teacher 
in a procedure in which they were gonna be asking another person a series of questions, that person was supposed to answer them. And depending on whether they answered them correctly or not, they would be punished. And in fact, for each question that the learner, that the other person answered incorrectly, they were, they were to be administered an electrical shock, which was going to be administered through a metal plate on the armrest of the chair that that learner was seated in. Furthermore, in their role as the teacher, they were told to administer progressively higher levels of electrical shock for each question answered incorrectly by the learner. And as it turned out, as the procedure went on, the learner would made a lot of, made a lot of mistakes. They answered a lot of the questions incorrectly. The participants playing the role of the teacher were supposed to be administering higher and higher levels of shock for each of these incorrectly answered questions. But at many points, as you might imagine, if you were in the place of this person, you might show some hesitation as you were asked to administer even more shock than you just had. And these levels of shock were displayed on a, what was a shock box that had all sorts of labels about how much more dangerous each successive level of shock could be to the person who received it. And, and the participants often showed a lot of hesitation. When they hesitated, the researcher who was standing nearby in his white lab coat and looking very official and very authoritative would say, your task is to administer the next highest level of shock for each incorrect response. Now here's where the power of the situation becomes very surprising because in advance of conducting this study, Stanley Milgram was just curious what his colleagues thought the outcome of his study would be. So he surveyed them and he asked, you know, do you think the participants will uh, respond fully to what the uh, researcher asked them to do, the authority asked them to do, or do you think that they'll stop? And nearly everyone that he surveyed indicated that they thought the participants would object, would withdraw, and would ask that the study be halted rather than administer higher levels of shock to the learner. In reality, what Milgram found to the surprise of everyone is that nearly two thirds of the participants continued to administer shocks to extremely high levels, even when the learner complained and said he was in great distress. So what it appears to be happening is that the authoritative sounding experimenter in his white lab coat created a powerful enough situation in which he was able to psychologically push participants into continuing with the procedure. It was not the case that the participants were indifferent or did not care or that they didn't feel guilt or any other negative emotion. In fact, <clears throat> quite the contrary, many of the participants felt greatly upset, not only during the study, but also when they were contacted months later and asked to reflect back on their experience in the study, they continued to feel the guilt, the upsetness, uh, the discomfort that arose from the possibility that they had been hurting another person. Now, it's important to mention that this learner, this so-called learner that they believe they were administering shocks to, in reality, was a part of the research lab and actually was working with the researcher. So while he was indeed strapped into a chair, his hand was uh, strapped to a metal plate, and he acted as though he was receiving the electrical shocks and would sometimes yell out in pain, in reality, that was all an act. But the real participant did not know that at the time. But even when they revealed that fact to the participant and said, look, we were just interested in testing how far you might go and administer shocks, but trust us, no one was actually harmed in the conduct of the study, that didn't matter. The participants still had to reckon with the fact that in the heat of the moment, they might have been administering a shock to a real person who was genuinely receiving it, and they continued to do it. And that was very disturbing to them. So what the Milgram study highlights is that the power of the situation can come in the form of a very convincing authority figure, that this person can have the potential to override our judgment, and that this is the case even when that judgment involves basic values that we take for granted, that we might believe could never be shaken. The other critical thing that Milgram's study demonstrated is that we are all very poor sometimes at predicting in advance 
what we might do in these situations, because it will not be surprising if you watching this would say, I would never do that. There's no way someone could push me to har harm another person. The problem is we underestimate the power of this authority. So a very powerful situation. The next type of power of the situation is conformity. And conformity is a natural part of our daily lives to look to others uh, when making decisions. Okay, we have a tendency to look to others naturally whenever we want to try to figure something out. Even when we feel we are being very independent, at some point we will use the words or actions of others as a guide to help us decide what we can or should be doing. And the information that we gain from others can provide a very powerful source of influence in these social situations. But one question is how far can we go when engaging in these conformity social comparisons. And one researcher who was interested in testing the limits of this was Solomon Ash, because he did some very famous studies that demonstrated that the power of the situation can sometimes get us to override our personal beliefs and judgments. Here's one example. And this is in a, uh, sort of a, my version of some stimulus materials that Solomon Ash used in a uh, very clever experiment that he did in which he brought people in and showed them a series of, of uh, uh, images and asked them to make judgments about them. For instance, in this one, if you were to look at the red line on the left, which of the three lines on the right do you think comes closest in length in matching uh, that line? And it probably should seem obvious to you. And if you were by yourself and making this judgment, you'd probably pick the line that's on the far right. Okay, that looks about right. Now, what if instead of you're answering that question when you were by yourself, you were in the room with other people? And in the procedure that Ash used, the real participant, okay, suppose that was you, might have been asked to answer the make judgment questions after they had heard other people express their own opinions, their own judgments. And in the study that Ash put together, he put people in a room with four others, but those four others were actually working as part of the study, but the real participant did not know that. But what would happen is that these other people, when they were asked, for example, with these lines, okay, which line matches in length, comes closest in length to the red line, they might respond the first line, the one that appears to you and me to be the shortest, but they might, not only the first person might uh, pick that, but what if all four of them pick that line? And from your own perspective, these other people, they look like you, they look like uh, other participants, so you have no reason to be suspicious that they're um, uh, playing a game on you, okay? In, in the heat of the moment, you're just assuming they are participants and signed up for the study exactly the same way you did. What would you do? Okay, you could say you're gonna stick by your guns and you're simply going to pick the same long line on the right that you picked when you were by yourself. But it turns out that if you're with other people, they can very much sway your judgment. And in fact, in Ash's research, what he found was that on average, across multiple trials in which participants were asked to give their judgment after they heard what others around them said. About 75% of participants agreed with at least some of the seemingly incorrect judgments that the others reporting before them had given. In other words, you're not an automaton and if you see others giving incorrect responses, that doesn't mean you automatically will always give it, but there will be times when their response, even though it seems incorrect, uh, but, uh, but uh, you have nothing else to base it on, you might agree with them as well. So there is a way that we can use other people as a source of influence and just go along with what they say. There are a couple of reasons why this may occur. And these are described as either informational social influence or normative social influence. That is, why do we use other people as a guide when we're in social situations? When it comes to informational social influence, this refers to situations in which we agree or conform with others because we feel we are learning something from them. In other words, there may be particular situations in which we assume that they know something that we don't. 
This is especially true whenever you go into a novel setting that you've never been to before. And you kind of look around to see what everyone's doing to figure out what is the appropriate thing that you are supposed to do. So for instance, when you first came to a new school and you're trying to decide various things that you're supposed to do in that school, such as when you take the stairs, are you supposed to stand to the right when you go up and down the stairs or do people not really care and they just stand anywhere when they're going up and down the stairs? We look and we learn from others and we call that informational social influence. So we're conforming because we're learning from them. But the second type of social influence is called normative and it refers to the degree to which we agree or conform with others because we are concerned about being evaluated positively as well as we're concerned that we don't want to be criticized by others. So any situation in which we care what other people think of us and in which it matters to us if other people like us is the type of setting in which we may guide and modify our behavior according to what we think other people uh, will evaluate as good or bad. For example, when you're in the classroom and your teacher asks the class a question, and maybe you know the answer to that question, but you're not sure if you wanna speak up. Why would you not be sure if you wanna speak up? Well, there might be some occasions where you know you wanna speak up because you want to impress others. You may want to look good in front of others and you think others will judge you positively for having spoken up. But now think about all those times when you think you know the answer, but you avoid speaking up in class because you're worried about becoming embarrassed because others might evaluate you negatively for speaking up, okay? And God forbid if you should um, uh, give the wrong answer, that's even more embarrassing. So a lot of times we base our judgments about what we should do around other people on whether we think that people will like us or evaluate us negatively, and that is normative social influence. So our reliance on other people, whether for information or for approval, can provide a very influential form of this type of power of the situation that we call conformity. The final type of power of the situation that I wanna mention is perhaps one of the most negative and potentially threatening. And it's the one that we often look to when we're trying to explain uh, large crowd events that turn bad. And this involves a process called de-individuation. We sometimes hear about events in the news where a crowd of people engage in something rather violent and we wonder why it happens. How did it start from being a crowd turning into something highly negative? And there's a classic example of this that's happened repeatedly in Europe uh, over the past few years. And this involves soccer games where at the very end of the game, no matter who wins, the fans in the stands will rush the uh, field and run out and they will actually encounter members of the fans from the other team and start a fight. And in fact, this happens with such a large crowd and such large numbers and uh, typically results in a major battle, a major fight between them that people have become very alarmed by this. And in fact, there were a number of steps taken to try to prevent people from gaining access to the field. But the question was, why did this happen in the first place? So what is de-individuation? Well, among other things, the simplest way to explain it is that it's a circumstance in which you become one with the crowd. You are melting into this crowd. And some people would call this the group mind. That is, when you're in a group, you're no longer just thinking for yourself, but rather the way you think and react melds with what everyone else is thinking and doing. And it becomes this group mind. De-individuation kind of results from that. And what that really refers to is this reduced sense of individual identity that's accompanied by a diminished uh, sense of uh, self-regulation or self-responsibility that can come over people when they're in a large group. And thinking about this very large word, very long word, de-individuation, the way to think about it is that it is the undoing, that's the D part, the undoing of our individuality. Okay, that's where de-individuation comes from. The person who first started studying this uh, de-individuation process systematically was Philip Zimbardo. And he actually developed a theoretical model that specified how certain conditions 
can create the kind of psychological state that promotes the impulsive and often destructive behaviors observed in mobs. In particular, he suggests that deindividuation results from, first off, a feeling of anonymity when we are in a crowd. So if we just feel like we are lost among the numbers of a large number of people, it pulls away from us our sense of individual identity and we feel anonymous. That in turn results in a lack of accountability or feeling of responsibility, which in turn relates to the energizing effects of being lost in the crowd. It is typically the case that when we are surrounded by a large number of other people, they've in fact documented that our level of arousal tends to go up. We tend to feel an increased arousal or energy that comes from others. And as a result of that, that often leads to a tendency to conform with others who define an immediate social norm that was developed on the spot within this group. Okay, and that's part of the reason why de-individuation is sometimes considered to be rather dangerous is because these social norms might come out of nowhere and be very unpredictable. What does de-individuation feel like? Well, among other things, it reflects a decreased self-awareness. Once again, you are not thinking about yourself. Your attention, in fact, is so overwhelmed by the crowd, by the, what's going on around you, that your attention is pulled away from you. As a result of that, you have less likelihood of self-evaluation. You're simply not thinking about what you're doing as being good or bad and you're less likely to criticize yourself. You also show less concern with how others evaluate us, okay? So you basically will not care whether other people think what you're doing is good or bad. And on top of that, you'll probably have less concern with how you are affecting other people. In a sense, this reflects a feeling of a release from the typical constraints of social norms. Because in our typical day-to-day -day lives, a lot of our behavior, behavior follows these social rules that dictate how we should behave so that we are being cooperative, we are being polite with others, and so forth. But when we're in this de-individuated state, we feel released from it. And as a result of that, we are less likely to feel a lot of the emotional constraints that typically make us follow these social norms. So we are less likely when we're de-individuated to feel shame or guilt or embarrassment or fear or any sense of commitment to some social welfare. The net result of this is a display of behaviors that are often more impulsive, more emotional, often irrational, and often antisocial or violent and a number of historical examples of places where de-individuation is strongly suspected to have been an influence include such really negative uh, historical events as lynch mobs, riots, and various military atrocities. Now, much of the research on de-individuation has focused on its emergence as a result of large crowds, but in fact, de-individuation can occur in any circumstance in which people feel anonymous. This can also include the cover of darkness. We're more likely to see de-individuated events at night than during the day. Also, Halloween and other circumstances where people might wear a mask or a costume are in situations where they have found evidence of more de-individuated behaviors. And also social interactions on the internet. In fact, this focus on our interactions on the internet is receiving increasing attention these days particularly when it relates to problems like cyberbullying, because under the cloak of anonymity, people are able to hide behind a screen name or an avatar, and that makes some people feel like they are not bound by the everyday social norms involving cooperation with others that we would ordinarily encounter. In this case, ironically, the power of the situation allows some people to behave more antisocially because they feel liberated from the responsibility of cooperating with others. So among the different social forces that I've talked about today, repeatedly encountering others, a process that results in this thing we call mere exposure, responding to people in positions of authority or power, this study of obedience to authority figures that we discussed, observing other people behave in a particular way that either informs us or maybe potentially evaluates us, 
can influence our degree of conformity. And then finally, feeling anonymous, such as in a large crowd, which can trigger this process of de-individuation. Each of these four things reflects some degree of the power of the situation, this invisible force that can potentially influence our everyday social behavior. These are things that you will be learning further as you investigate more about social psychology. Thank you.